Buenas, tar buenas tardes. Buenas tardes. Sí. sí vamos a dar comienzo, vamos a dar comienzo al, al panel de, de ideas para la, la, de, la democracia participativa del futuro. Eh, ya tenemos aquí a, a todas las personas panelistas. Eh, eh, como no tenemos mucho tiempo, eh, vamos allá eh, a, a dar paso a las presentaciones y luego iremos a, a las preguntas porque supongo que, que después de, de dos cónsul, aunque nos hemos reunido tres veces en Madrid, eh, hay mucho, muchas reflexiones para las personas que o bien hemos estado eh, o estamos en, en las instituciones o desde la sociedad civil eh, están colaborando y, y activando mecanismos de, de participación ciudadana y de democracia más directa y participativa. En primer lugar, eh, va a intervenir eh, eh, Pauline Alois, eh, de, de Quantum Budget. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Alois Pauline, and um, I used to research for the last 10 years or so of my life how we can use technology to bring forward a new generation of democracy. Now, if you are interested, um, I've published a couple of things on that topic, and uh, today I would like to speak about how we can use the latest findings from science and the latest findings from technology to come up with a new form of public financing. Now, we're speaking democracy, right? So, what is democracy actually all about? Now, democracy traditionally is all about middlemen who decide on our behalf. We go, we elect people, we elect representatives, and those representatives then go and appoint people like judges, like mayors, things like this. Now, what is the reason that we have representatives at all in the first place? Well, the reason is very simple, you know. You can't have 1,000, you can't have 10,000, you can't have 1 million people um, deciding on each and every simple daily political matter. Well, at least in the past you could not. In the past, the parliament was something very progressive. In the past, party politics was something very progressive. But today, we actually have the knowledge that we can go beyond these things. And this is the point where I would like to introduce you to liquid democracy. Now, what is liquid democracy? Let's assume we have a community of people. And each of those people have some political power which they are holding. Now, liquid democracy is a very simple idea. It's about delegating this power. There's a couple of very simple rules. Each person can delegate its political power to some other person. The second rule is that any delegation of power can at any time be again revoked. And the third rule is that these delegations of power can be accumulated. Now, the first rule means for you as a citizen that you actually don't need to be bothered with actively participating in politics. So you say, okay, I don't have the time, I don't have the expertise, I don't want to have an opinion on something. So you go to somebody you trust, you delegate them your power and stay out of the whole game. The second rule means you can at any time re-enter the game again. Now imagine there's something going on in politics which you don't like or where you have a decided opinion on it. You say, I step in, I revoke my delegation, and I express my own opinion. So liquid democracy is an incredibly powerful way how we can assure that actually everybody can have a say in politics. But then again, liquid democracy is not an either-or option. You know, it's not a model which would replace the existing institutions which we have. You can have them in parallel. So you can still have the parliament, you can still have ministries, you can still have the municipality, and you can side by side introduce liquid democracy. And the cool thing is that you can do actually everything through liquid democracy. You can pass laws, you can develop policies, you can empower people to, be, to act on behalf of the society. And what you can also do is, you can do also public financing through liquid democracy. 
And that's the thing which I would like to talk with you today. And this is the point where we come to the quantum budget. You see, the quantum budget is a very simple idea where you, as an individual, um, you don't, the money which you owe to the community doesn't get taken away from you as we have it today. So you still pay taxes, but not informed that somebody goes and collects the taxes away from you, but you just keep your money in your own pocket, and by this you finance things in the public. So if everybody keeps their money in their own pocket, how can we as a community go and finance public things? You see, the whole thing is, all those locked away shares, they form together what is called the Virtual Communal Fund. That's the VCF. And each share, it's an individual quantum. This is where the quantum budget as such gets its name from. All those quanta together can then be virtually linked. And the cool thing is, again, they can be managed through liquid democracy. Let's go back to our sample community from before. Let's assume there are some people who are making active tax contributions. And Bob, Frank, they are all actually paying money to the community, while the other guys, they just have their political power. And then we bring in some delegations. And now, let's have a look how this thing can look like. For example, so this is one model how the power in the community can then be distributed. In the first row, you see how much actually each member of the community has contributed. In the second row is the worth of each quantum based on this model. And this means that a maximum power in one given moment of time of the people is either 100, 300, 300, 300, 300 because of all those delegations. That's just one flavor how a quantum budget can be implemented. Here is another one. Here we assume that instead of the actual contribution which each individual does to the community, everybody is controlling an equal share. So it's more of a social model. Everybody is controlling an equal share of the overall um, quantum budget. You see the delegations, the maximum power changed again. Now, what does this whole thing mean for you as a citizen? Let's put ourselves in the shoes of Eve and let's, you know, make an example. Let's say Eve is, you know, she's very unhappy about this whole migrant situation, you know, and she's a woman of action and she decides, okay, we have to do something about it. And her idea is, okay, let's maybe go to the country where all those people come from and let's bring them peace and economic prosperity so that they don't need to come to our place. So what Eve does is, she drafts a budget, she drafts a plan, tries to convince people you know, to, to, to support her, and she comes up with the thing that such an invasion of a foreign country would, would cost us, let's say, 350 um, units per year. Now Eve, at this moment, is controlling 300 units, which means we see all of a sudden something very deeply democratic happening. Eve needs to go, and she needs to convince the other people to support her. So she's still needing 50 units. And she needs probably to go to Frank and convince him to give her some money, while at the same time keeping a balance with the existing network and not to lose their trust. And maybe Anne would say, not under my watch. I'm not going to put in my money to finance an invasion of some other country. And she would revoke her delegation, and by revoking her delegation, 100 units would crumble away from the political power of Eve in a given moment. And then maybe the end would say, okay, an invasion is a cool thing to do, but I don't want to delegate 100% of my power into this venture. So he would say, okay, 50% is cool. And again, what happens? the political power of Eve, which she holds in the given moment, crumbles away. And this, ladies and gentlemen, is some unbe unbelievable level of democracy which we can achieve today by modern technology. And this brings us to the question, why at all shall we do it? 
Why should we go and develop a new generation of democracy? Well, there are two reasons. For the idealist, the reason is very clear. Liquid democracy is the most democratic form of democracy humanity ever invented. Science is very clear on that. There's nothing more democratic than liquid democracy. It's more democratic than direct. It's more democratic than indirect democracy. And for the realist, the reason is very simple. There's a lot of economic potential in such a change. It creates a lot of new jobs. It creates a lot of scientific and technological development to bring us forward. This last picture is actually a book which is coming out these days. Um, this small 10 minutes talk can't, of course, cover the whole complexity of the topic. Here you find it covered with 300 additional pages. You are very welcome to have a look on it. With this, I thank you for your um, attention. I'm here for you. Approach me later with questions. And thank you very much. Thank you, Alawa. Now, intervene Anselm Brem. Hello, everybody. Oh, it's pretty loud. Um, I am from Berlin, Germany, and I am um, from the NGO More Democracy, or in German, Mehr Demokratie. Um, it's more a perspective of an activist right now, not so theoretical like before. Um, totally different. Um, our motto is Mehr Demokratie is the driving force of citizen initiated referenda and a better electoral law. Every vote counts equally and everybody has the right to participate. That's what we stand for and what we, what we um, our self-understandment. First, I would like to say something about my NGO, Mehr Demokratie, some introductions, and then I um, would like to, um, I, this lead us to our actual work and what we are, would like to do in the, in the future, what we are doing to plan in the future. Uh, only uh, s s um, some facts about Mehr Demokratie. We were founded in 1988. Uh, Mehr Demokratie is the largest non-party organization promoting democracy in the European Union and the biggest non-governmental organization for direct democracy in the world. It's imperial, not for profit, and um, yes, we are a founding member of Democracy International also. Um, what we are doing, um, right, it's a little bit loud, huh? Um, what we are doing, actually, um, we're making campaigns, we make uh, policy, po policy advices, lobbying um, for more democracy, uh, scientific analysis, and legislative proposals and democracy issues. And in, at least in Germany, we are somehow a watchdog for more democracy when something, well, for democracy when something, our, out of our perspective goes wrong, we say, hey, that's uh, not right. We, we talk to politicians and make campaigns. Um, what are we doing? Um, and leads us to um, what, our, what are our topics? We, we try to implement our, um, um, the citizen initiatives of, and referenda at the national level. Um, we make reforms of direct democracy at the local and the federal level, also reforms of the electoral system and the parliament proceedings. Um, we um, try to democratize um, the EU and make proposals. Strengthening the freedom of information is also a task, and strengthening the citizen participation also. Our main achievements right now, we are now 30 years old. Um, we, have, we made many uh, achievements, but to these two I would like to point out. At the beginning, in 1988, there were um, two <coughs> states um, in, in Germany. I think it was, it was Bavaria and I think it was Baden-Württemberg. They had um, direct democracy or something like direct democracy. 
And now, 30 years later, we have in all 16 states direct democracy in the, um, on the um, state level and on the local level. And that's, yeah, we are proud of that. We push that forward. And we are also proud of that, that we are um, helped to implement the European Citizen in Initiative in the Lisbon Treaty. And that is also a goal achievement that we, I would like to point out. So we um, we're reaching um, more and more the, the present. Last year, there, were, um, there was uh, the election year in Germany. And uh, it was, I don't know if anybody f um, from you saw it. Um, and we, we made a big, big campaign for more democracy for our, our issues you, you saw right now. And um, spoke with 400 politicians, made every, every week we made some, some actions. And just give you, a, I would like to give you some examples to show you, to give you an exp expression that is um, all the pictures are in Berlin. We had a big alliance for our issues supporters, every logo you can see here on the picture is an NGO who supports us. Um, yes, there we were also in Berlin on a um, um, party um, house from the CDU, the Conservatives, to claim out that we are here and we would like to also speak um, um, with, um, yeah, the media was also there, where we did lots of things. I think that is the quite nice picture. On the right-hand side, you see the Bundestag. On the left-hand side, you see um, the, the house with the bright uh, windows. In there, there the politicians um, are discussing if they or how they should govern Germany the next four years. And we were loud and down... Uh, it's a dark picture, actually, but we were there, <laughs> downstairs, at the, there down on the river, and we're loud and say, hey, we, we are also here, don't forget us. Yes, another action picture. Um, at the end of the day, in February this year, there was a coalition agreement. It's, I think it's a special German thing that um, when two parties are joining and make a coalition, that they make a coalition agreement. That's it's a cornerstone paper where they, it's a roadmap what they will do in the future, in the next four years. And we were super happy because our, it's German, sorry, um, we were super happy because um, our um, claim for more democracy were in it and we made a party and, you, and after the party we read it again and I will read it to you. We will set up a commission of experts to develop proposals as to we, whether and in what form our proven parliamentary representative democracy can be supplanted by further elements of civ Civic participation in direct democracy. In addition, proposals should be developed to strengthen democratic pro processes. Yes, it's nice, but it's only nice because there is very much if and very much might. And we thought, ah, a commission of experts should renew our democracy. No. So we thought about what should we do next, and we came. Hey, we we should ask all. German citizens, but it's not possible. So we come for the idea. We make a Bürgergutachten. It's a, germ, a long German word. It's something like a citizen panel. It's something like citizen assembly. It's basically a s smaller group of random selected people who are um, um, discussing for a long term the issue. And we thought this is the good question, and this is. A perfect form for, form for it. And then we um, got some partners who were experts on this field on the local level, but not on the national level, and made a plan. Here's a plan. And now we are beginning in January uh, with the agenda setting. And yes, and at the end of 2020, we would like to be finished with that. And um, the, the plan is to get the results back to this small group of experts and um, to forward them to the, the commission of experts. That's uh, the idea behind. And yeah. Um, yeah, we come now to the, to the things we also will do in the future. Of course, the close vision. We would like to, that's why we are here, why I am here. 
we, uh, we would like to implement Consul in a big German city like Munich, Stuttgart, or Berlin. Um, and then a far away vision, perhaps. Next year are um, European elections, and we wrote papers. We recently wrote a book, and we'll pu publish that uh, in every language in, um, in Europe um, to, to get, get our um, proposals forward. Um, it, it's called Rethinking and Reshaping Europe. And um, I don't would like to go deep in it, but um, you can download it when you would like and, and give us feedback. Um, and the far, far away vision is uh, in a globalized world with a highly globalized economy, we also need a globalized version of democracy. Perhaps we can speak a little bit in the panel afterwards. And that is also we have in mind and we, we, we think about it. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty much the end. I would like to end with a sentence of an um, exec executive committee um, member. Um, when we stop developing democracy, she will cease to exist. Thank you. Thank you, Anselm. Uh, now it's the turn of uh, Marian Kramers from the Democratic Society. Hi everyone, can you hear me? This mic may be a bit more merciful. Um, I'm Marion Kramers from Democratic Society. Unlike what it says in the program and on my badge, I'm not actually British, I'm from Belgium, but our organization has made an organized Brexit ahead of time. Um, so thank you very much for, for having us here and for inviting us. Just a very quick one on who we are. The banner up there is what's on our website with lots of disclaimers of how politically neutral we are. And we're very proud of that and we think that's very important. But what our work actually means is that for the past 11 years, we've been working across Europe, um, starting in the UK, but now also working in Italy and Georgia, also outside the EU, um, on projects that actually think through and design and implement citizen engagement and participation and participatory budgeting of all kinds. So we don't just defend one single model. Our idea is to rapidly develop many of them and when it works in one place, take it to the next place, make sure we disseminate that information, make sure it becomes measurable, that it becomes replicable. So we're very much the, um, the consultancy of citizen engagements, but trying to fail fast and also move on fast so um, we mature these models. And based on the experience of the past 11 years, I wanted to share some thoughts for the future. So five specifically. Um, our first thought is that, do I need to move this way maybe? Yeah. Our first thought is that we have worked, and frankly we still do largely, um, on a project basis, meaning we go in for a one day, two day workshop, for a weekend engagement, for several weeks, for several months, our longest project is 24 months at the moment, which is going in the right direction. But we have very much acknowledged and we hope to also preach it to all of you that we need to move from projects onto system change. That the time for individual one-off projects is, is over, that we really need to make sure we bake every change into, into the law, into the structures, into the next government that comes into power, make it resistant as well to political change, which is a very difficult one, I'm particularly thinking of a project I'm running in Sicily at the moment. So make sure that somehow whatever we do is sustainable, is not a one-off thing that can go away afterwards because you create disillusionment, and I'll touch on that later. The second thing, and I come from a technology background myself, is that civic tech is not the same as startup tech. Startup tech, the Silicon Valley type, is there to ramp up as many users as they can in as short um, amount of time of, as possible, and to make sure you keep them within the platform, you keep them very active, you grow, and then the Silicon Valley model is to then sell off your enterprise. That should not, and, and I hope is not, the, the model of uh, civic technology like console, and I know it's not the case for console, but it's something to keep in mind as well, because it's very easy to take lessons from Silicon Valley or from other technology pieces and kind of borrow them. But I think we need to understand that civic tech is fundamentally different. And what the democratic society has also seen, and again, that speaks for console, is that the, um, is that the open source tech is, is 
very much more resilient than any other kind of technology, that it sticks much better and it's adapted much better and it, it crosses certain boundaries um, much more easily than, uh, than technology that is much more dependent on investors or commercial, mo uh, commercial models. The third point is about being connected on a multi-level um, basis. And so this is something we are redesigning our entire organization around at the moment. We believe, and based on the past few days, I think many of you are with me, we believe at the Democratic Society that the best place for trust in government and for solid citizen relations and solid citizen participation to be born is the local level. But then the question arises, once you've done that a couple of times, is how do you scale that and how do you make that count on the higher levels? On the regional levels, we have so many federal states in Europe, on the national levels, on the European level, on the level of the Council of Europe, of NATO, and also beyond that. How do you somehow network that? And so one thing we are working on very much is a network of partners, and I'd be very happy if someone was to talk to me about that, a network of partners across Europe, also outside the European Union, where somehow we can deploy methods and we can deploy learnings, but also bring them back to as a network level. We also increasingly see that there's a need uh, and a demand for that from the, the, say, the higher levels of government. And so we are being approached by several organizations, not just the European Union, but also initiatives like Climate Kick, like the Council of Europe as well, like UNDP, that somehow want to build that with, the, with us. But what you need to build when you do that is not just a network of partners, but also a sustainable business model that makes the entire network, including the partners, survive commercially, financially, whatever you want to call it, and make sure that somehow you get the same kind of reliable quality insights, the same kind of information sharing on all sides. And these are human organizations. Every human organization is incredibly difficult. It becomes more difficult the more you cross borders and the more you grow it. So I think we need to prepare in a way for the fact that the people in this room in the next few years will be spending a lot of their time and a lot of their thinking on how to make that network work aside of how to make the citizen uh, part work. Um, and that's um, not always welcome, but it's work that needs to be done, I'm afraid. <laughs> and then uh, two more thoughts is the bad actors move as well as the good ones. It's a bit like a chess uh, game. Never forget the black pieces are moving as well. And so we know the kind of age we live in. We all read the newspapers and, and watch the orange monkey on the screen. Um, and. Uh, I think it's important to realize these are not evolutions happening alongside what we do, but they're very much ingrained or they will be even more ingrained in our operations. So it's very much a case of making sure that anything you do, anything you design, is, is, has an answer to disinformation, has an answer to fake news, has an answer to the, um, the corruption from the outside when it enters these systems and that also we work together very closely on sharing the experience on how to combat that. And there also, I would encourage having a conversation with an organization like NATO and with the Strat Stratcom department they have in Riga, because while they may not be our comfort zone, they are on the front line of this and they're, they're also developing very much the same thinking we're working on. So it's unusual alliances as well that are going to see us through this, I think. And then the last thing, also a point in alliances is long-term changes in culture, short-term uh, changes in structure, and we need both. Um, in the business world where I um, spent uh, some of my life, uh, there was always this, this cliche quote that culture will eat strategy for breakfast, and that's absolutely true. What we're seeing today in Europe and elsewhere is a cultural shift. Um, I think we need to play much more of an active role in that, in influencing that, in knowing that change is inevitable and, uh, and, and change is man-made. And uh, in order to do that, again, we need stronger alliances, and we need stronger alliances, again, with the unusual suspects. Um, so not just between each other here in the room, not just between governments and citizens, but with every actor in society, from labor unions to commercial enterprises to international, um, international uh, organizations. So those are five thoughts on the future. They're um, not meant to be uncontroversial. They're meant to get us thinking and to, um, to spark some ideas, and I'll be very happy to discuss them going forward. One thing I also wanted to share is our um, project management um, approach. If this resembles the classic consultancy model, then that's because it is exactly the same thing, and I think it should be. It should be a professional approach towards lasting change, sustainable change that is 
uh, addressed in a holistic way. And so tools in there is one component, methods is another component. But around that, there's a lot of awareness of culture, of va values, of people, of policies. There's a lot of awareness as well of the community you live in, of the practice you develop or you have to develop, the kind of training you need to do. And the fact that what what comes out of that process, it doesn't just need to be a tangible deliverable that you can describe, that people can see, but also needs to be measurable, that you can show the impact, that you can compare the impact when you implement it in different places, and that it becomes some, something of a scientific approach. And we try to work together with academic institutions to achieve that kind of rigorous research, because ultimately it's our credibility that, that depends on it. And so even if in the eyes of the person that commissioned us, being very often the local government, the project was a success. And even if it's a success in the eyes of citizens, we still need to make sure it's a demonstra demonstrable a success towards the outside world as well. And that's a component that's very easy to forget because it's painful, it's hard work, it's inconvenient, it still needs to be done. And then the last point, this is my best friend. He brings out the best in me. And that's because he looks skeptical and he looks tired and he looks like he has a million other things on his mind. And those are the citizens we work with. And I think that's something to keep in mind. I think when you work in an industry like this, in organizations like this, you get very excited. We've all built up years to be at the place where we are at now. It's very easy to confuse the end with the means. The end is not participative democracy. That is the means to the end. The end needs to be a better life for this guy by hook or by crook. And so I think one very important component is responsible experimenting, or in fact, no experimenting at all anymore. One of the biggest uh, projects we're running at the moment is um, had its first meeting um, a couple of weeks ago. And the one resounding thing that came out of that was that the citizens in that place, and it was Britain, they've seen a bit more of this kind of projects, were completely tired of experimentation. They were completely tired of, of, of being dropped from one project into the next, of governments coming in and feeling so unconfident about uh, and insecure about um, what they were doing. I think we need to, we're, I mean, we're 11 years in, your organization is even older than that. We need to now develop a common practice, maybe Consul is a, is a great place to start, a common practice that is confident, that can go forward, and that can become a foundation for something else. The second thing is, remember people's problems are different from government's problems. Many people in this room work for local governments, either directly employed by them or work for them the way we do. What happens is that you'll end up working for the problems of your local government, but not necessarily for the problems that are top of mind for the people. And so I think that is a very important one to keep in mind. Make sure your ultimate client is always a citizen. And it's, again, very hard to keep in mind when you're in the midst of a hundred million projects that are flying around. Thank you very much. Finally, uh, Yushan. So, hi everyone. Um, so it's my pleasure to present my work in progress um, in Consorcom which actually I have a mixed feeling because last year I was working with uh, Ayutamino de Madrid for three months. So first of all, I uh, would like to say muchas gracias for Madrid City Hall and Taiwanese central government for supporting my field work. And secondly, I would like to um, thank Ayutamino de Madrid and the Media Lab for organized Council Call and for giving me a chance to share some of my preliminary findings and um, yeah, which I hope you will be enjoying. And uh, so I'm going to talk about the um, trajectories of digital urban politics um, by using the case of Design Madrid and V Taiwan. Um, so by digital urban politics, which seems a bit like loosely like defined concept, I'm trying to kind of, I mean, I, I basically mean the digitalization of urban politics. And I, I hope I, I could explain a little bit more through the slide. So the outline of my presentation is that I'm going to talk about what kind of comparison methodology I'm going to apply and, and you know, where, where did all this trajectory start and what forms politics, reflecting on what form politics they got implemented. Um, so what, why, why comparison? Well, um, yeah, uh, I was pretty much inspired by a kind of imagination of comparative urbanism, which is, it's uh, which aims at learning from comparative cities 
They are very, very different from each other. It's across the global north and south. So the reason of doing it is, is so some urban, like urbanism, they, they have done this to, to develop a more relational and planetary understanding of uh, the urbanization. So based on this concept, I, I think my research aims in showing the trajectory of digital urban politics in Madrid and Taipei to create a planetary understanding of the digitalization of urban politics. Um, so I would like to highlight again my intention is not to rank or to compare which digital platform is better or produce a better democracy than other. Yeah, I'm not going to create this competition, but trying to see how we can learn from each other. So I would like to argue that um, the trajectory of digital urban politics began at the Occupy movement. It's where the urban politics encountered the digital, and both in Taipei and Madrid. So it, it, would, it, could, it could be argued that it is when the digital from the hashtag to hapak, from live stream to n minus one were brought into making, creating a kind of politics, a kind of digital politics, which as Alberto argues, reinvent the political role of cities and where other, a lot of people, a lot of scholar, famous scholar has been working on and using different terms like multitudinous identity or techno politics or um, political activism, which I've been learning a lot from them. So um, my understanding is like digital technologies, they're, um, they are not just digital object per se, but they have been brought into the Occupy movement acting like political actors. So that actually empowers some perhaps real-time decision or enable to the public to imagine a, a very different form of, you can say, democracy, you can say politics. And I, I, I'm going to use this quote um, from just an ordinary citizen, which is a student in the Sunflower Movement. She said, before the movement, I have no imagination of democracy because the Sunflower Movement is a public demonstration. A demonstration belongs to the public, which, which manifest, manifested our imagination of our society and our country. So this is, you know, we, we're starting to create a new form of politics by rejecting the one we don't like, the, the black box decision making. So uh, it's, it's also the same in Madrid, but which I sh I'm sure you know very familiar with, so which I won't spend too much time on that. But having said that, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that there is only one trajectory of digital urban politics that comes from the Occupy movement. There are many of them in Madrid and Taipei. But given the, the limited scale of my PhD research, I can, I, I only, I, I'll be able to only identify and focus on two trajectories emerging from the Occupy movement. You can see the first one, which um, most of you, I believe, are very familiar with, and some of you have played a very important role in shaping it. And I'm not going to spend too much time on that. But the second one is actually from, from the Sunflow Movement and to, to all the experiment done by a CV hacking organization, the name is Gov Zero, and there's some CV hacker zones and some informal meetings with politicians and um, and in one of the hackers um, uh, Minister Tsai proposed the project of the Taiwan. Um, so it's, it's what, what the effect of the Occupy movement has been, uh, have a lot of impacts in, in any possible way because the central government announced that the, all the demands claimed from the Sunflower movement has been a social consensus and they, they realized that um, there has been a value of applying this paternalistic public participation. That means the government knows. They assume they understand what the public wants, but eventually they fail to understand and they refuse to listen to the citizens. So which is why V Taiwan was born in such context, which is quite different from Design Madrid, because V Taiwan was proposed by a minister and but she, she seeks for help in the Gov Zero hackathon. And okay, now I, I, I will just briefly talk about what sort of agency did this digital technology, digital platform play in Design Madrid and V Taiwan. I would say, well, according to my interviews, um, they all try to, 
enable a kind of collective uh, process, be it fail or not, you will say oh, all sorts of um, processes are collective through this platform because you can see in Madrid that people create a content or take the decision. They have to do it together in one way or another. And also in, in V Taiwan, while they use police, a particular way to participate, it's, you, you are forced to interact with other people um, in one way or another in order to get the consensus and has to be well, more, more or less agreed by different opinion groups. So, um, but I, I would like to say some implications in what kind of politics are these platforms are shaping. Um, it's very interesting because uh, when I was in Taiwan, I interviewed a senior officer in the um, central government and he actually showed, to, talked to me saying that, oh, V Taiwan, but you know, V Taiwan is not going to change any political structure. It's not going to change any political relationship at all. So um, is it going to create a kind of po post-democracy? Um, well, I'm still analyzing it. It's not the conclusion, but it's really interesting to see how they see the platforms. And also, well, in Design Madrid, I'm sure most of you are very familiar with the annual one, 100 million U EU participatory budget, which resulted in, I would say, a kind of incremental urbanism where the projects are burgeoning, say, from the food bank, social housing um, for refugee or victims of sex, sexual uh, violence. But having said that, I'm, I'm not suggesting there has been no participative gap or saying that all the homeless or the dis disadvantaged people are now voting and deciding on Design Madrid. But I can see, I can see its intention, which is um, towards to a kind of cosmopolitan uh, politics of the common, which try to serve uh, people with very different uh, interests. So it's still to be concluded, yeah. And um, on the other hand, I, I would like to reflect on how digital these so-called digital platforms are. It's very interesting, all these political participative processes enabled by V Taiwan and Design Madrid, they have ne never been 100% digital. So you can see in v, v Taiwan, the key participative processes is conducted to fa in face-to-face -face deliberation or discussion. The most important political decisions are being made in the face-to-face -face meeting. And also, well, some evidence about Design Madrid. In the citizen votation in Design Madrid, there are actually more than 50% participants voting by post or by paper ballot. So, um, finally, I'm going to talk about the future of, well, say politics or democracy. Um, I, I, I actually, I, I mean, coming from a like, social scientist background, I'm always a kind of bit confused about what, what people talk about um, social networks or ne networks in general, digital networks. It seems to be somehow like digitally exclusive to me, but um, I, I will actually kind of recall some kind of more network which still exists in our everyday urban life in, in Spain and in Madrid, uh, in Madrid and Taipei. And so echoing this kind of cosmopolitics uh, where different and hybrid network coexist and co-present rather, rather than excluded from each other. So um, I'm going to um, end my presentation by providing a kind of network still existing in Madrid, which I found very interesting. So it's just in my field, field notes, say, um, in the evening of the Pueblo Nuevo community, you can see kids, sorry, the typo, uh, screaming and playing on, on the street, and while adults are sitting on the steps of their front door chatting, uh, other homely neighbors choose to chat on each other from the balcony. Yes, you will have to speak a little more loudly than the normal. So, is it possible that we can, you know, combine different kind of networks and work together? That might be my kind of one kind of possibility of the future future politics I'm talking about. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Marian, Yashun, uh, Alwa, and Ansel. Now we are we are going to the we are passing to the to the public.
to public questions. So when it comes, so we're, we're, we're in this, we're moving in this phase towards like greater participation. Everyone, everyone likes this idea. Um, but then what about implementation of the things that people participate in? And so like there is now that we're seeing the open source methodology play out as like a main factor in encouraging participation, we still haven't really seen that same methodology applied to like how governments actually operate and get things done. So I'm curious how you see that, pro if that process is gonna unfold, if we're gonna see the open sourcing of government operations at like a more granular level, and if so, when, if not, why? I mean, um, that's a very good question, thank you very much, about, about how, who is actually the one who carries out a project which has been decided in a participative way in a, in, by the community. Well, it's always, you know, traditionally projects are being carried out by some organized entities. Organized entities can be then like state actors, it can be NGOs, it can be individuals who receive funding to carry out a certain task, to reach a certain goal. So I think there is, it's, it's, you know, we don't need to be restricted just to institutions to count on them, like public institutions, to carry out things. And this is, this is a very big problem we have in the, in the context of uh, participation. Because if, you, if, the, if the community decides on a certain matter and says, okay, we want this to happen, then uh, as things are today, then you have like the municipality or a ministry or whoever who goes and tries to implement it, and by this, they try to interpret what actually the community wanted to be implemented. But if the community itself has the possibility to organize and to carry out projects themselves, then, that's my opinion, you have a much clearer implementation um, achieved. And this is something, just to make the bridge to open source and, and uh, Floss software and things we were speaking uh, these days, it's the same in, in, in the software development. You know, software engineers are the ones who carry out their, either their own ideas or ideas which other people task them to do. So, um, yep. And can I just quickly add to that? I think the open source idea is great and definitely needs to be there, but I think sometimes our sector tries to reinvent the wheel a bit too much where Normally, the mechanism towards uncovering this kind of information and comparing it across the field with other comparable sources is called journalism. And we just need much better quality journalism by journalists that are also much better trained in data analytics. Um, so that, I think, ahead of, of many other things needs to be fixed because it's also equally in danger today. Hay alguien más eh, que quiera preguntar? I ideas para la democracia del futuro? Eh, entonces So um, some of us, we are students in a master, and right now we have this challenge about um, creating a space and, um, how do you say this, like improve the service of the platform of the CIDE Madrid. And uh, for me personally, it's been very difficult to design this platform uh, so that it's like more 
um, comprehensible for the users, but um, how can we uh, manage to not create a Facebook of ideas? Like, you know, because one thing that it's very difficult for me is that nowadays digital, it's very, um, how do you say this? Uh, it's digital, it's very, like everyone can particip participate, uh, but also has a dark side, which is like the standardization of some ideas, like Facebook uh, and all these platforms. Usually people make their ideas and it's like, like, don't like, and sometimes the debate, it's not like very uh, high quality. So how can you ensure the quality of these debates in digital platforms? Like, it's like, it's only my, um, fear. <laughs> Thank you. So not in the name of the, of the democratic society, but I worked the past seven years in marketing technology, mainly on social media. I think the one fundamental mistake Facebook made was the algorithms, is that ultimately the reason why people want to spend so much time on social media platforms is because we have it ingrained in us to want to do basically socialization, to want to compare ourselves to others and compare ourselves to the group and see where we sit and function to the collective. And that's a valuable exercise, even if for the individual sometimes it leads to insecurities. In general, it's how we go through life, it's how we come to um, act well in groups. What happens is with Facebook, it creates an algorithm that creates echo chambers that only confronts you with people that act and think exactly the way you do and never confronts you with the other side. So I think lesson number one for any platform we create is try to consciously show people the entire picture and then try to then bring them towards a common denominator, a common denominator of, of civilization, of culture, of, of nationhood, of citizenship, whatever it is. But socialization is a wonderful, exp a wonderful instrument for that, which we all have within us. And in fact, technology like Facebook has undermined it. Okay, maybe just contribute on that topic from a technological perspective. So, um, what Marion said is very, very, very true from a conceptual perspective, but when it comes to actually implementing uh, algorithms which would guarantee that the discussions are more um, expert-oriented, more professional, um, you face very severe technological challenges because it's very hard to understand on which level a uh, discussion is working. So one way or the other you face um, the, the, the task to get some experts on board who then provide their own opinion or uh, somehow rate the quality of a discussion. And uh, by bringing in experts you already create a new layer of let's say also censorship because then you create some middlemen, some guards some gatekeepers who then are the guys who say, okay, the quality is good, the quality is bad, um, that's the direction the, 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 the discussion should go and not. I remember I've been also working with people who, who deal with these things on a scientific level and uh, try also to develop new models for um, the domain, the domain then is called mass online deliberation. Like if you really try to bring uh, gigantic amounts of people into a streamlined discussion where you have at the end some uh, some some opinion which would represent the um, the yeah, overall opinion of the group which is deliberating, and it's extremely complex. Bringing it on a level of Facebook, where as Marian said beautifully, people are there to you know spend their free time to engage with their peers, and actually people want the echo chamber and they feel quite happy with it. Um, there's an um, interesting experiment in, from the um, a German, a big German newspaper, and it's called like, something like "Out of Your Bubble," and that's exactly what you said. That um, the persons you are normally not talking with, they con they get connected, and in the best term, they really meet each other, and that's perhaps an idea. Some thinking like in this way. 
Bueno, terminamos aquí el, el, el panel, ya no hay más tiempo. Y muchas gracias. Thank you very much, uh, all of you. Bueno, estamos terminando ya casi con Sulcón de este año y queremos tener un, un ratito para reflexionar eh, sobre lo que hemos eh, ido viendo en estos días y pensar un poco en el futuro. Eh, la idea es que, bueno, todos los que habéis estado aquí tenéis algo que aportar. Yo os voy a pedir dos cosas. La primera es que os acerquéis eh, todo lo posible, estar aquí cerca porque vamos a intentar trabajar entre entre todos. Entonces, si podéis venir de las últimas filas y sentaros lo más cerca posible, os lo agradezco. ¿Vale? Y mientras me hacéis caso, más o menos, los más colaboradores, de verdad, venga, lo estamos consiguiendo casi. Eh, vale, y os voy a, bueno, a ver si conseguimos sentarnos. Os explico un poquito la, la dinámica que vamos a hacer. Vale, aquí la idea es, eh, como os decía, intentar que entre todos pensemos en, en hacia dónde tiene que ir Consul, qué, qué, debe, cómo, qué, de, qué nos falta, qué retos tenemos planteados, qué tenemos que hacer. Y, y bueno, lo que vamos a hacer es bueno, que algunas personas elegidas al azar suban de hecho, bueno, tenemos cinco sillas, van a subir cuatro personas eh, y, el, y la dinámica es, ahora veremos a ver cómo se eligen. Estas personas empiezan a hablar, dejan una silla vacía y cuando alguien tenga algo que decir, sube a la silla vacía y baja uno de los que estaba arriba. ¿Vale? La idea es que, que todos tenemos eh, parte aquí, vamos a intentar hacer una sesión colaborativa, de, participativa. Eh, bueno, vamos a ver... Si se estabiliza, sí, sí, esto, sí. Si podéis acercaros un poquito más, porque ya que no somos muchos. ¿Podemos intentar acercarnos un poquito más? No, ya la timidez llega. A... Venga, sí, venga, lo estamos casi, casi consiguiendo. Jorge, venga. Venga, pues sí. Si hay voluntarios, eh, podemos hacerlo así. Si no, elijo yo al azar a alguien que quiera. Venga, dos personas más que quieran subir a Selilla primero. Venga, Ronald. Los latinoamericanos, a leer, algún europeo que suba aquí hasta a, a la silla. O africano. ¿Nadie más? ¿Lo elijo yo? Jorge. Venga. Sí, cierto, Jorge, siéntate, por favor. No, Jorge, perdona, siéntate, que sube María Belén. Sí, toda Latinoamérica, son más participativos y llevan más tiempo. No, 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 esta se queda vacía. Entonces, la dinámica es, eh, cuando alguno de los que estáis ahí tenga algo que decir, se sienta en la silla y uno de los cuatro se baja, ¿vale? Eso es un poco... No, 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 uno. Uno, el que haya, preferiblemente alguien que haya hablado ya, ¿vale? Entonces, eh, yo lanzo la primera pregunta 
y a partir de ahí empezamos a hablar todos. Entonces, la idea es eh, plantear vuestras dudas, plantear preguntas, plantear cosas que digáis, esto no está resuelto, esto cónsul eh, lo hace mal, o, o los procesos basados en cónsul esto lo hacemos mal, o, o deberíamos hacerlo mejor, o, o, o no sabemos cómo hacerlo. ¿vale? Esa es un poco la idea. ¿Qué nos falta? ¿Qué nos sobra? ¿Qué, qué cambiaríais? ¿Cómo podemos mejorar? ¿Cómo podemos trabajar mejor en común? ¿Vale? Eso es un poco el, la idea de toda la mesa. Y yo quería empezar con un tema que, bueno, que es recurrente y que es casi de los primeros que tenemos que plantear, que es cómo convencer a un ciudadano de que tiene que empezar a usar una plataforma de estas cuando la lanzamos. ¿Vale? Entonces, eh, os paso ya la palabra, digo, a ver, ideas. Eh, cosas que habéis hecho que han funcionado, cosas que habéis hecho que no... Bien, perfecto, hay otro micrófono. Eh, que no han funcionado, cosas que diríais, estoy muy orgulloso de, de lo que hemos hecho en mi ciudad y que esto ha, ha sido genial. O cosas, es más útil todavía, cosas que digáis, esto no me ha funcionado, no lo hagáis nunca. ¿no? Eh, bueno, creo que todos nos conocemos ya en estos días. Igual voy a decir que si vengo de Montevideo... Y uno, este, con estos meses que, que ha ido desarrollándose la plataforma, en realidad, eh, como todas las cosas, eh, genera al inicio ciertas resistencias y dudas, particularmente. Porque para cualquier gobierno, y particularmente de nosotros, eh, existe y seguramente es de las cosas que, que uno todavía tiende a pensar que, que los cambios siempre son favorables en la medida de que la gente se involucre. Y bueno, lanzar digamos, una forma de participar eh, desde el gobierno, ya digo, creo que en general todos manejamos redes, participamos activamente de algunas cuestiones, pero desde un gobierno es todo un desafío y, y realmente es un compromiso enorme desde el punto de vista del de, de lo que puede demostrar, digamos, como gobierno la apertura hacia, hacia la ciudadanía en el sentido de la participación. Y, y para nosotros en estos meses la verdad que ha sido toda una, una satisfacción, incluso colectiva, porque lo ha tomado el intendente así como liderar, liderar un poco el proceso, porque también estos procesos no son fáciles de instalar, eh, que, que nos ha generado, digamos, un encuentro con un montón de ciudadanas y ciudadanos que no teníamos, que realmente no tenían ni un canal de cómo y dónde y de qué forma presentar una idea, una propuesta para la ciudad. Y seguramente todos tenían propuestas en alguna medida de, de su lugar de región, de origen, de barrio. Este, y a, como primera reflexión, digamos, nos pareció que eso fue muy bien aceptado. ¿No? Es decir, que en general la ciudadanía encuentra ahora no ir a una ventanilla para plantear un problema, generar un expediente, sino que tiene un canal directo de ahí que me parece que es la primera cosa que para nosotros es altamente positiva. Y segundo, para no ser tan extenso, creo que hay un tema que nosotros deberíamos colaborar más en la formación de estas herramientas con la ciudadanía. Es decir, la búsqueda permanente de que tenemos algo que se instaló como una plataforma que tiene estas características de diferentes módulos y nosotros necesitamos que la ciudadanía logre comprender para qué está hecha, de qué forma se instala, cómo resuelve los temas, si es posible o no decidir sobre las cosas de la ciudad. Y a mí me parece que eso sigue siendo un desafío que nosotros creo que en este tiempo vamos a desarrollar un poco más el trabajo hacia ese lado. Vale, eso me sugiere algo interesante, ¿no? la diferencia entre formación y publicidad. Porque por lo menos en Madrid hacemos mucha publicidad, hacemos eh, online y todo, pero, pero no sé si hacemos mucha pedagogía. ¿Alguien, ¿Alguna idea sobre esto? ¿A alguien se le ocurre eh, 